welcome to Design on Show. So Design on Show is presented by the City of Sydney and is um, today is in partnership with the Interactive Media Lab um, from UNSW. And we have two uh, very awesome speakers. So Oli Bowne from the Interactive Media Lab at UNSW and Kaz Grace from the Design Lab at the University of Sydney. So I hope that your brains will be tingled by what they have to say about computational creativity and AI. So I'll just hand it straight over to them. Oh wait, I have to do the acknowledgement of country. So uh, thank you all for coming today. And um, so I'd just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So a couple of housekeeping things. The toilets are just at the back of the corridor. So if you need to go, feel free. Um, we will be filming this event, but your faces won't be filmed. So unless you stare directly at the cameras, um, no, no harm in that. So we'll just pass it straight over to Ollie and Kaz, and we hope you enjoy the session. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming along on what has turned out to be a gorgeous Saturday. I uh, hope we can be more interesting than the park over the road. Uh, all right. So I'm Kaz, and I've been working for a little while in this area of creative artificial intelligence. And I wanted to run through, before we start talking about the prospects for AI in the creative industries. I wanted to run through a really quick background on AI to try and separate the fact from literally the fiction. So it turns out that creativity and AI have a lot of history. And the people have been talking about creativity and the capacity to be creative for as long as they've been talking about machines that could think in any way. It turns out that uh, Ada Lovelace, who uh, worked with Charles Babbage on the analytical engine a very, very long time ago, sort of wrote in her memoirs about whether this machine that a lot of people were speculating uh, was a thinking machine. It could essentially just do some equations, some quite complicated equations. As she wrote in her memoirs that it had no pretensions to originate anything. It could only do what you could tell it to do. So she was firmly in the camp where, uh, where computers, such as they were at the time, had no capacity to create. If you fast forward, uh, well, 115 years, then in the 1950s, the field of artificial intelligence itself was formed and named. Uh, there were Four very prominent scientists, mathematicians, and uh, computer scientists uh, at the time got together and thought that over the course of the summer, with a bit of support uh, in terms of funding, uh, they could probably figure out how to make a computer that exhibited human level intelligence with about 10 people and three months. Slightly overly ambitious. Uh, incidentally, so this was McCarthy, Minsky, Rochester, and Shannon. There is one name from the founding era of computer science that you might be familiar with, uh, Alan Turing, sorry, wrong slide, Alan Turing, uh, who wasn't there at the time. He had actually committed suicide uh, just two years earlier after being castrated for homosexuality. So keep in mind that all of this stuff uh, happened in that context. But at that uh, research conference, at that seminar, uh, there was a discussion about the notion of intelligence and creativity. It was considered central to what an intelligent computer could do. And they said that there was this idea about the difference between creative thinking and unimaginative yet competent thinking was the injection of some randomness guided by intuition. Uh, 60 or so years of creativity research of sort of hearkened to the idea that randomness might not be enough, that there's more to this than just guided randomness. But it means that the th thinking about whether AI and creativity could be separated goes all the way back to the start of the field. But back then, people were talking about AI as in literal human level intelligence, but out of machines. If you fast forward another 60 years to now, then the, th the phrase AI is the new electricity by by Andrew Ng, who has variously worked for Stanford, Google, Facebook, Baidu in, in China, um, Coursera. I've probably left out a ton, actually. He's on the boards of a ton of startups. 
Uh, he has a really excellent uh, course on Coursera on machine learning. Thanks for bringing that one up. But this idea that AI is the new electricity, electricity itself isn't that exciting. It's the things that it lets us do. It's the, it's the appliances. It's the way it makes its, uh, itself known in our life. That's what electricity has brought. And that's what modern AI has and will do. So I just wanted to briefly talk about what are the capacities then of AI now? If AI is the new electricity, what are the roles that it can play and what are the things that it can do? Because we're not quite at the point where there's a button on your keyboard that will have an idea for you. Uh, we're still doing that. So the first and probably most common thing that AI can do is to predict. And this is anywhere where data turns into answers, and you would usually have an expert analyze that data, you can instead set up a uh, machine. So this is a really interesting case. Uh, IBM's Watson uh, is able to identify melanomas. Given a picture of, of a mole or some other uh, skin uh, condition object, you can tell with a reasonably high level of accuracy, that is a level comparable to a skilled dermatologist, you can tell whether it's cancerous or not cancerous. Uh, so this is prediction. You have some data, it leads to an answer. Other kinds of prediction are the ability to automatically generate captions for an image. These are quite a bit more complicated than just a yes, no answer, but it's doing quite well. Man in black shirt is playing guitar. Black and white dog jumps over a bar. But the application of AI to prediction has a number of limitations at the moment. The chief among them that you need absolute tons of data. And that data, at least the vast majority of it, must be labeled, which means you must know what the answer is to the question that you're predicting. So you need not just a large database of moles, but you need to know whether they are cancerous or not. Not just a large database of images, but images already with captions. And of course, it only works on very well-defined problems. Is this cancerous? You can find this anywhere data provides answers. Uh, you can think about medical help, house prices, all sorts of different places. A similar technology, but a very different application, is AI for personalization. You might have heard of recommender systems. So Netflix is a classic example here, uh, where virtually their entire front page is picked by recommender algorithms, is picked by AI. You, you can't really browse by category unless you go right down to the bottom and you look for it deliberately. They want you to interact with the service based on the algorithms that are selecting content for you. Personalization is useful in other areas as well. Personalized medicine is the uh, use of machine learning, the use of AI technologies to scan you, so blood tests, DNA tests, other kinds of things, and then select a medicine and the dose for that medicine that's perfectly fit to you. Rather than just give you whatever the medicine is that is most likely to work for your condition, and then if that one doesn't work, go on to the next one and so forth. So this, you need lots of data about the users or about the products that you're recommending or both. And it really isn't so great at context. You might have noticed if you use a music listening service, it doesn't notice that you've left work and really want to listen to different kinds of stuff now than you did when you're sitting at your desk. You might have noticed Netflix doesn't handle switching users very well. This kind of thing is already seen virtually anywhere there's media, virtually anywhere there's content, and we're only going to see more of that coming soon. The third kind, I think, the third role for AI is probably the one that we most think of at the moment where we're talking about AI, and that's these digital assistants. I think that assistant is an excellent name for these in a marketing context, but to understand what they do better, I think the name a liaison. They, they don't assist you with anything that you're doing, but they can just liaise with services that they already know about. If you, they can hook into maps, they can hook into weather, they can hook into travel, but they've already been hooked into those services. They already know how to interact with them. And if you think about it, these are just a much better working, much nicer interface to stuff that we've all used before, not to put them down in any way. So, the limitations here, as I said, it can only liaise with known services. 
and speech data is particularly data hungry and any time you want to put on a new accent, any time you want to localise to a new area, even within the same language, you almost need to start again. So you need all that data again. Apparently using Siri in Scotland is hilarious. <laughs> It, of all the English-speaking countries, it is the one with the most uh, terrible performance. Apple is working on it, I'm told. So this is found, of course, anywhere there's conversations, spoken conversations, written conversations. A much lesser known example, this is uh, now number four, uh, of what AI can do is to help visualize things. There's a lot of data that has many, many dimensions. You know, it can, the, the ways a font can vary are, are uh, huge. But AI can be used to take those very high dimensional things and squish them down into two or three dimensions so we can see them. So this is a space of fonts. You can see the bold fonts up there and then close uh, nearby fonts are similar and you've got italicized and script fonts over there. This could help you pick out a font for your website or whatever. This one, the trick is that you need a meaningful way to represent the object. If I said let's embed songs, in a 2D visualization, we'd have to think for a really long time about what's a good way to represent a song. That's not straightforward. And of course, this could be used in visualization and exploration. It's also kind of helpful in a, another way, debugging what we do. You can use these kind of visualization techniques to help figure out what's wrong with other AI. And then there's AI that does stuff, uh, actually performs a task. And most, most of you would probably think of uh, robots. But also there's software uh, agents that can help solve problems entirely within a computer. You might have read last year about how an AI beat uh, this is the South Korean champion of Go, uh, Lee Sedol. This one's particularly interesting in thinking about creativity because there was a particular move, move 37 in the second game, I think it was, that uh, was so surprising was so novel, was so different to what any human master would have played. And in fact, the AI knew that it was a one in 10,000 likelihood that a human would play that move. And yet it still overrode the database of human training that it had and decided to play this move. And it was an extremely effective move. I don't know anything about Go, so I can't tell you why. But it, he won, it won that game. It won all but one of the games, in fact. So the limitation here is while you can work in a slightly op more open world, a video game or a factory floor or a board game where there's a lot more choices, but it requires very precisely specified goals. You need to know exactly how to win. You need to know exactly what you're doing. And, and these systems can't really branch out beyond that. So of course, robotics, video games, that kind of thing. And now we come to the interesting one for today, create. AI used to create new things. These are not real images of birds or volcanoes. They are entirely generated by a computer, pixel by pixel from scratch. And what's interesting to note there is that it's really good at volcanoes, because volcanoes are kind of structurally simple. They're good looking volcanoes, but a volcano is kind of like a pile with a red bit on top. Some of these ants have no heads and two butts. Ants are harder. Uh, that bird has no neck. I showed an architect friend those monasteries. Other kinds of creativity, other kinds of creative task at least. This is a, a startup that purports, we haven't actually seen it, them publicly released it yet, but says that they can go from a mock-up, an image of what a website should look like, to a fully functional website with code and everything. And that would be very, very interesting. Um, it might be terrible, I don't know, I haven't seen them actually do it. So the limitations here, as I said, they struggle with, at the moment, higher order structure, generating from scratch rather than copying and varying an existing human-made example. It really struggles with things that, uh, that even small children have no trouble with, like that the ant has a head at one end, a thorax in the middle, and, and a butt at the other end. I'm sure that's the technical term. Um, they can't think outside the box, although that's an area that's been had a lot of work put into it, and, and Ollie's going to talk a little bit about what that might mean. And they struggle collaborating with people. Almost all creative activities aren't solo. Uh, and for a machine to work with a person requires some kind of understandable dialogue. That's really tough. So are these going to be applied to the creative industries? Maybe, probably, but how soon? Don't know over to you. 
Thanks, Kaz. So can everyone hear me okay? Yep, great. So um, I'm just going to say a few words about actually lo looking a bit more into the kind of uh, theoretical work, work about what creativity is. Um, because in the field that we both work in, we both basically do work where we're looking at systems that generate um, outputs such as the kind of visual images you saw. Um, and a lot of the time people have, get very flummoxed about exactly how you go about um, talking about the creativity of such a thing. So this is just in a, in a few short points, much like Kaz just gave us an overview of AI. And um, so there's just really four themes here. One is that it always involves some kind of search, and generally we can describe that in terms of a blind search. Um, a well-known researcher in the area of um, creativity theory, uh, Dean Simonton, um, actually uses the metaphor of a, of a radar um, performing that kind of classic rotating sweep that we all know um, as uh, to indicate what he means by the blindness of a search. And he's very careful to distinguish that from randomness. So when you say that a creative process involves some kind of blind search, um, he wants to emphasize that that doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. It might be a very systematic process, but the point is that the thing you're out to find um, you don't know the way to get there. Sometimes we talk about that as heuristic search, um, and there's a whole load of theory describing what kind of an algorithmic problem that is to find something when you don't know where it is, um, and you don't necessarily, don't necessarily know what you're trying to find. You might have some criteria, um, or you might even just say, I'll know it when I see it. So that's an essential part of what we're talking about here. Um, related to that, uh, there's tons of evidence that human brains are structured so that they're actually very good at certain types of creative task. So this idea that we perform, um, we're, we're, we're able to perform a, a systematic search uh, is, is captured in a lot of theoretical work about creativity. Um, for this slide, I'm just recommending two really great books if you want to go and read more about this. One is The Creative Mind by Margaret Bowden and the other is Creativity by uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. When you study creativity, you spend a lot of time learning to spell this guy's name. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, I learn it for about a couple of days, and then I forget it again. I have to go and look it up again. Um, anyway, so human brains are really good at this. They have mechanisms that do this kind of search. So looking back at um, the really early days of creativity theory, early, early 20th century, we have ideas like a process of incubation, where we uh, try and formulate a problem to solve, and then um, our mind does a thing where it's kind of doing a background search process. And you, don't, you, you might have had that experience where you wake up in the morning and you suddenly work something out, or you know, having, having a great idea in the shower. Um, so there's a lot of work in this, and um, I won't go into the detail, but that's important to understand that we have these kind of mechanisms for performing creativity. But really important as well is that these are social mechanisms as, as well as individual mechanisms. So one of the most creative things we do, ironically, is we copy from other people. Because if that's the only way that we actually have the great value of creativity in human affairs is that we've learned to copy the things that someone else has created. So everything in this room designed at some point in human history we have them here, not only because they got discovered at that moment, but also because they got copied through all of those generations. So that's absolutely essential to understanding creativity, and quite often easily overlooked for the obvious reason that it's slightly counterintuitive. Uh, next, um, you really can't pin down a specific thing that is creativity. So you can't really take look at lots of well-known individual human acts and try and kind of put those in a box and identify what makes them creative. And in particular, the, the field has really moved away from the, the study of the lone genius, who must have some kind of capacity that frames what makes them creative. And now we take a very holistic approach that uses many different um, uh, frames uh, of reference and contextual factors to think about what creativity is. So I like to think about how uh, you can describe uh, nature, evolution, the stuff that happened before any humans were around, in fact, it's the stuff that created us, as being a highly creative process. That's obviously not involving minds, 
or thinking or designing, depending on who you ask. Um, but it has this incredible power to create. So I think that's a good example of why you can't pinpoint it. Um, but this is probably the most important point because mostly what we're talking about, uh, most of our work is in the area of music, art, design, these areas that unlike science, although design, all of these things, design in particular straddles different areas, but unlike science, they're all about cultural production. So one of the most important frames for understanding uh, the stuff we're doing when we're generating pieces of music or pieces of art is actually to understand the frame in which that's happening. That's not always about creativity. That can be, again, that can be a lot about copying. And one of the really big themes is it can be a lot about identity. So I've decided to choose mods and rockers as my example of um, identity and um, uh, style. And there's a wonderful body of theory here about how um, we adopt these things, not just, you don't just listen to music because you like it and um, like the music that you're exposed to. There's a complicated grounding in your, in your social existence. You might be part of a group, defining yourselves as different from another group, um, and that might be a force that um, drives the things you're interested in. So there's a complicated dynamic of what makes people like certain things. Okay, so um, those are just four themes to think about, and there's loads more I could say there. Um, what I want to do is look, at, look a little bit at the ways that people, that systems that do automated creativity are starting to emerge. And one of the, um, one of the really strong things that's beginning to emerge, which Kaz alluded to, is that um, we're beginning to actually have real automated creative systems that people are using, but they're always in a, what we call a co-created form, which is always a human doing something, usually most of the thing, of the creative task, and the system being designed that it can support that task. So we, we now commonly talk about co-creation as a, as a major theme, and these are all primarily co-creative modes of interaction. So um, the first is, um, these are terms that I've made up and that um, are being published at the moment in a paper, but they're pretty self-explanatory. The first is operation-based interaction, and that's where you're using a tool to do something. So if you were a composer, you might be using a digital audio workstation to compose music. You might bring aspects of AI into that workflow. So you might use a generative system to compose the baseline for your piece of music. And you might just be selecting some parameters and pressing go. So you're operating a, a piece of machinery, piece of software, uh, just like any other piece of software. This is an example of style transfer, which is one of the more exciting developments that's been happening recently in the application of AI to art. So this is a photograph that's been manipulated to look like a, I'm gonna get this wrong, Van Gogh? Thank you, Van Gogh image. Um, and we can do that kind of thing now. So this is using the kinds of, same kind of networks that Kaz showed earlier with the volcanoes and the birds and the, and the ants. Um, but applying, taking one level of information in the image, the kind of background, the, the actual content, and then another level, the, the surface. So these things are beginning to emerge in software that we use, and they have parameters. We just control them, we operate them, we choose what uh, source images or source styles we want to use, and we just mix them together. Um, there's a great history of artists who code, and these artists... Um, also co-create with their systems. So this is Harold Cohen, who is one of the better known um, uh, historical figures who just died last year. Um, and he coded his own generative art systems. And he worked with those systems. By working with them, I mean mostly that he went, looked at what they did, changed the code, looked at what they did again, and also curated their output. So that's another form of operation, except this time the code is actually the, uh, the mode of interaction. So here's a different type of interaction. This is called request-based interaction. And that would be where you basically ask uh, a piece of software to generate something for you. And that's pretty different from what we generally do with computers these days. Except we do that all the time when we're searching. So when we search Google, we're asking the internet to tell us what's out there with some criteria. So you can think of a, a Google search as a good metaphor for what a request-based interaction with a piece of software might be. 
Um, and um, we're beginning to see, uh, not really quite yet, but we're starting to see the emergence of this idea that you might request for some music to be played. Um, this is Alexa, the Amazon um, uh, uh, interface that you, you talk to. And, and at the moment, people are asking things like, I want to hear some calming piano music. And there's, this is from the existing corpus of music, so this is not generative. But you can see how that can shift very easily to a situation where you ask for some calming piano music and that gets generated for your needs as a creator or as an end listener. This is some work going on at the moment, um, uh, recent work where, where the authors used an evolutionary algorithm with a, with, uh, a neural network uh, detecting certain things. So the network knew, how, knew what certain things looked like. Uh, it knew what mushrooms looked like, amongst other things. And um, they generated original images and the neural network said, yes, that looks like a mushroom. And you can run this process of search where this new, this is actually a 3D mushroom um, being detected by a 2D image recognizer. So you can generate things that have qualities, but they're original. That's not actually any of the original mushrooms that the system had been trained on. Um, Request-based interaction points to quite an obvious way in which we're starting to see this kind of technology being used in creative industries. And it's the relationship between a human client and a machine producer. So the user might take the role of the client and say, I want something like this, show me what you've got. And they pitch to you. That's why we've got Don Draper up here. They're doing the pitch and you're saying what you like and what you don't like. You're giving feedback and that's, that's the iterative process. And the third category is ambient interaction. This is um, uh, Adobe's uh, content aware feature in Photoshop, which enables you to remove something from an image and have the system intelligently fill out the background. It's really impressive um, and it's generative, but it's mostly performing, uh, as Kaz mentioned, a predictive task uh, because it's, all it's trying to do is work out what probably was in the background. Um, why do I call this ambient? The reason is that basically you're, you're just focused on removing the object. The AI does some stuff, you don't really care. As long as it looks right, you're happy. So it's an ambient, you're not telling, you're not controlling it, setting parameters, it's just doing its thing. Um, so we're gonna move into a couple of examples and um, the first example is actually in that um, ambient uh, space. So this is of work that we find interesting at the moment. And um, uh, this is a, a project called Darwin Tunes, which generates um, music. Um, and it uses, again, an evolutionary algorithm. So the, so the music has a DNA. And that DNA can be mutated and mixed together. And over time, uh, can be evolved towards certain targets. And this is played over the radio or um, SoundCloud. They set up an internet radio stream um, and people could listen to that music and they could just rate it. They could just say whether they liked it or not. And over time, those ratings would feed into the system and over time, the system would try and generate music that was more highly rated. So again, I would describe that as an ambient form of interaction because you're listening and you just it's just one tiny bit of feedback. I like it or I don't like it. Um, some colleagues of ours are working on a system which is a game, a mobile phone game generator where rather than just downloading a game, you're downloading uh, an entire world of possible games and then you can explore new games. So these are all games that generally involve balls flying around and things bouncing and some kind of gold. You might have to avoid something or you might have to catch something or you might have to collect all of the balls. But the game is completely open-ended in terms of what the design could be. And this is very interesting from the point of view of how we might see people interacting in the future using generative content. You might decide that for your loved one's birthday, you're going to make them a game. And you're going to use this tool to do it. So this is an example of kind of massively empowering people to, to mass produce and create content, which is very interesting. And I think that's over to Kaz as we carry yeah. on. Yeah. So another one that you might have heard of 
in the news in the last couple of years was IBM's Chef Watson, where well, they applied their Watson AI platform to generating recipes. Uh, so they actually have a tool online uh, where you can go and you can play around with this, and it suggests ingredients after you pick one to start with. So here I, I started by picking salmon, and then it recommended a bunch of other things, and I can go, oh, I like that, I don't like that. And in the end, it generates recipes. We've got one here, which is, uh, is based on a fried calamari uh, 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 recipe to start, but it's replaced the salmon, uh, replaced the calamari with salmon, and then messed around with a couple of the other uh, ingredients in order to fit in blueberry, which is one of the things that it had generated that it wanted here. Uh, so it can generate many, many recipes with many, many possible combinations. And it has an idea of what flavor combinations are synergistic, what flavor combinations are surprising, what flavor combinations belong to different culinary traditions. And it can uh, adjust those parameters itself. So it can decide it wants something surprising, or you can tell it that you want something surprising. So there's an interesting uh, space of possibilities there with machines that can take on some of the evaluation themselves. So the human goes beyond uh, just being a curator. The machine's putting out many thousands of things and you pick the ones that you like. The machine might actually do some of that selecting for us. It's not perfect if you look through these recipes. Uh, it still calls it a salmon squid dish. They got the name wrong, even though it, I mean, it basically puts salmon into a squid dish, but that's not a great name. So not perfect. Another one, I mentioned uh, AlphaGo the machine that beat the world champion at Go. There's uh, been a new project in that called AlphaGo Zero, which is about producing an alpha, uh, a Go playing game without being trained on millions and millions of human successful games. So AlphaGo Zero learned to play this game from scratch. Uh, and you can see that it uh, played, and after three days of just playing against itself, it was already at the level of the version that beat Lee Sedol, the Korean champion. And after 20 days, it was at the level of AlphaGo Master that beat the world champion. And after 40-something days, it was better than any other known Go player ever. Now, when I say days, it has hundreds of computers working constantly. So it's not like a day of effort in the way you or I might put in eight hours at the office. But still, that is a remarkably short amount of time compared to the number even of computational hours that the previous systems used. And this one wasn't starting from watching expert humans. It was starting just with the rules of the game and playing against itself. A neat part of that is that it always has a training partner at exactly the right level. As it improves, so does its partner, because it's it. Uh, so this one, I actually won't play the video, but uh, there's been some really interesting work done uh, by Sony in partnership with a university in France um, by a colleague of ours uh, on transferring style between music. So this takes Bach's uh, chorales in particular, Ode to Joy, and uh, produces what that would sound like if the Beatles made it or if it was played as a, by a Brazilian guitarist. It's really worth a listen. Check that one out if you can. You can just look on YouTube for flow machines. Great. Thanks, Curtis. Um, OK, so we're getting close to the end. Um, so we just, we've given you some examples. And we want to give a brief sketch of some of the things that we think this technology is doing to society, this area of work. And it's obviously something that people are asking um, in general, automation, removing jobs, and um, changing the workplace. Uh, and actually, I, I've been working on a book o on this subject, and I started it a year ago. And, the, and I think I was still really trying to explain to people why I thought it was interesting to talk about how this technology might change the workplace. And within the last year, like, you can't find anyone who doesn't want to ask that question or like, what's going on. Um, so it's really amazingly fast-changing time. Um, one question might be about authorship. So there's this, there's this question about what, what this means for people producing creative content. And this is a cultural question. It's not just about the economics of production. It's about the identity and about the, the, the social and cultural aspects of production. And we have so many examples online. Uh, again, this has been a deluge of, of, of reports and stories. And they always start with some kind of question like, is this the first ever computer composer? 
will this remove jobs, uh, put composers out of their job and stuff? We have take our musical Turing test. Listen for yourself whether you think this sounds like human music and is going to surpass human music. Um, so I really just want to throw that up there as something to question because when you see something like take our musical Turing test, that's a test where you try and decide whether you're listening to something that was made by a human or a, or a computer. You don't really have enough information to make a good judgment because you're going to be played a piece of music. We could do that if we clicked on that link. Um, and generally these, this music sounds fantastic, but you really need to be able to dig into what the context was in which someone pressed play to generate that thing. Was it cherry-picked? Was there a lot of human knowledge coded into it? Was it just a kind of plagiaristic system? I'm not saying that uh, uh, there are brilliant systems out there, um, but this is what we need to understand. I think authorship, I think there are two ways things will go. There are different contexts. If you think about architecture, you've got architecture where you know the name of the architect, like you can go down and see the Gary building at UTS, and then you've got architecture where you're walking down the street and who cares who, who designed that. Uh, same with music. You have jingle music, you have your favourite bands. Um, we'll, we'll see authorship kind of divide along those things that no one really cares if they're generated and the things that we really care about, the identity, the authorship of that stuff. Here's another technology, um, Ava. I met with them in London. They're doing very interesting work. They want to make uh, one of the greatest composers in history, so they really want to give this thing uh, an identity. Uh, but actually, at the same time, they've got a very practical goal, which is to um, produce a system that they can use. They're, they're, a, they're a kind of um, film score and advertising score production house. So they don't care too much about identity in that respect. Um, but they want to use the system as their first iteration for rapid development of an idea that they can put in front of a client. Um, really nice idea. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily require this identity and authorship. Uh, another question people ask is, uh, are, we, are we safe? And that could mean like I'm a producer and am I safe in my, in, in my job or do I need to train up? Uh, or it could actually mean something else that I'll refer to. But um, yes, if you're, a, if you're working in this area, um, there is nothing to fear. Uh, here's an example of some machine learning generated uh, band, metal band names. I love um, Inhuman Sand uh, <laughs> from Russia. Uh, and then I'm not too sure about Jazzy from the United States. So this is, there's a lot of comedy work going on with generative content at the moment. And I think that points to something that basically um, these kinds of technologies push out into new directions. They don't necessarily replace uh, existing work. What's kind of obvious is that if you're, if you're tech savvy, then you can take advantage of those things, and that's probably a good thing. But um, I think we're seeing, we are seeing the classic story of these worlds colliding. At the same time, this technology makes people be, just manage to do things quicker. So you might find that there's a reduction in the number, in the amount of work available per person, but that's not to say that people go out of business. But uh, I think this is our final slide, and uh, this is just to leave it on a slightly more um, speculative but really important point. Um, these are the mods and rockers again, and here they are in Brighton, chucking deck chairs at each other, uh, they, they form these cliques who fought each other. They didn't need to do that, but there are cultural dynamics and sways and, and political movements and so on that cause this. We are in a situation right now where computers and, and social networks have great power to manipulate people, and we're seeing that. We've seen that with uh, the, the last US election. Um, and generative content creation, particularly stuff that affects people's emotions, uh, and particularly stuff that steers people into different cultural directions, actually has huge power uh, when it's put in the hands of a small number of people. There's not been a lot of talk about that, but it's really starting to emerge as a topic. Uh, for example, we've seen examples of Peppa Pig being turned into sexually explicit content, which can sneak through the radar of YouTube and be fed to children. That would be an example of a very malicious use of generative content or, or maybe done manually. Um, but we can see all of these examples starting to emerge. So we were supposed to give lots more time for questions. We've run over a little bit. We started a bit late, but now we would like to get you guys involved in this discussion and ask, um, ask anyone if they want to